Voodoo is a religion practiced in parts of the Caribbean and the southern U.S., combining the elements of Roman Catholic ritual and traditional African magical and religious rites characterized by sorcery and spirit possession. According to the National Geographic, over 60 million people worldwide practice voodoo. Hold my broom, I'd like to tell you a story. It's about a woman who was described as beautiful, charming, caring, and men. The men could not say no to her, no matter who they were or what they had to do. Remember, I said that. Her name is Josephine, a Bible-quoting, church-going, hard-working school custodian who loved and took care of her six children. It's said that she didn't have too many female friends. She only pretty much was around her daughters. If it wasn't them, she really didn't want to get too friendly when it came to other women. She probably should have stuck to that philosophy. It would be a woman that would ultimately help aid in her downfall. She collected roots and teas and she hid them in her bedroom. She concocted these ingredients and these recipes and she would cook for her friends and acquaintances and the people they would eat. They say she held power over them after these meals. They would do anything she asked of them, whether it was family or acquaintances, they would do it. Quote, she's an evil witch doer. She has a long history of witchcraft, end quote. That was said by Linron Good Jr., the brother of one of Josephine's men who would do everything that she said. This story goes as far back as 1974. Only Josephine herself knows what she'd done before then. And I believe it probably was a few things, but nothing as serious as what I'm about to tell you. Norman Stribling had grown afraid of his wife. He said she was a voodoo practitioner. And he had seen his name during one of her spells that she was casting. He also had awoken and found Josephine pointing a gun right at him. The gun misfired, or he would have been dead. He was very scared, telling everyone he knew that his wife was going to kill him. She had also been having an extramarital affair with William Robert Gray. In the early morning hours of March 3rd, 1974, Norman Stribling was found dead shot to death by a bullet to his head. The circumstantial evidence left behind shown that Norman had more than likely knew his murderer. There were no arrests in his death, even though several people had came forward, including two of Norman's own brothers, and told authorities that Josephine had asked them to murder her husband, Norman. Josephine and William had been charged for conspiracy to commit that murder. The trial never went to court. Many people believe Josephine used voodoo and witchcraft to intimidate witnesses to not testify. Some even moved out of Maryland. The charges were dropped. She received $6,000 in life insurance from Norman's death. Almost a year later, in 1975, Josephine would marry William. They used the life insurance money to put a down payment on their new home, and they lived together. Josephine, now 35 years old, throughout the 16 years the Grays were married, she started having several affairs on William with other men. In the mid-80s, Josephine had taken her 16-year-old cousin, Clarence Good, offering him a better life, saying that she would be like an older positive role model in his life, along with her husband, William. Clarence actually improved living with the Grays. He had turned his life completely around after leaving Brooklyn, New York, finishing school, getting jobs. It was almost like he was a different person compared to the path that he was almost about to go down while living in New York. William had came home one day to the sounds of two people involved in heavy passion. 
It was his wife and her cousin, Clarence, who was now in his 20s. William confronted the two. Josephine had threatened to kill William, and her cousin Clarence seemed like he would back her up. William knew exactly what his wife was capable of. Remember, he had been a part of it before. Clarence was really taken by Josephine, a beautiful older woman who had taken a sexual interest in him. He thought that this was a big deal. He felt like a man. At least to his friends, he was. I bet they high-fived him every time he spoke about his sexual conquest with his older cousin. William now was very afraid of his wife and even Clarence. What were they going to do to him? He really felt that his life was in danger. He told anyone that he knew what had been going on between Josephine and Clarence. Josephine had actually physically assaulted him with a screwdriver and a bat. He tried to remove her off of his insurance policies, but it failed. She was still the benefactor. He went to the police along with two of Josephine's children. These were his stepchildren, and they both explained to the police what Josephine had been up to. William had spoke about the incident where Clarence driving in the car with Josephine flashing the headlights had pulled out a gun on him. William had to speed away, saving his own life. He went straight to the police. Warrants were actually issued against Josephine and Clarence. William moved out, fearing for his life. He moved to Germantown, Maryland. He lived at 12... 626 Gray Eagle Court. He left and he felt a little bit better after moving away from his wife. I'm sure when he spoke about his friends and family and even the police about his wife, he couldn't have told them everything. On November 9th, 1990, William was found shot to death in his apartment. When the police had told Josephine that her husband of 15 years was dead, she never asked how. She never even showed any kind of emotion. Search warrants were obtained by the Maryland Police Department to search her home. Police found a single round of 45 caliber ammunition in her home. The same ammunition of the gun that was used to kill William. Josephine said that she didn't own a 45 caliber. In her home, police also found the voodoo dolls that had resembled her friends and her family members. They were stuck with pens. Josephine received $54,000 on her husband's death. Though she and Clarence were considered a suspect, no arrests were made. She told the people closest to her as long as she practiced her voodoo, she would be all right. Everyone else heard her thanking God and she wasn't to blame for any of these things that were happening. Quote, Jesus Christ has enemies too. So when I follow him, I know I'm going to have enemies. End quote. She said this and she also said that there was angels all around her. Josephine was now living alone with her young cousin. I didn't know how he truly felt about her. Remember, she was an older influence. She saved him from the path that he was about to go down when he was living in New York. She turned his life around. So in some sense, he probably was grateful for her. And the two lived together as cousins during the day and something a lot more at night. Someone of authority was following these cases of Josephine Gray. They had to figure out what was going on. The deaths were very suspicious. Detective Joe Modano of the Montgomery Police Department, he would get a court order to be able to bug her home and try to get information on Josephine. Modano hoped the recordings would tell what she was involved in, in the murder of her husbands. But it was going to tell something. Josephine 
one of her daughters and Clarence were performing a voodoo spell right then, inside that home. She was casting the spell on two detectives involved with her deceased husband's case and the prosecutor, Jim Trusty. Madonna would say that it amused him. It didn't bother him that much that she was putting a curse on him, but I see it bothered him a little. So he continued trying to find ways to bring Josephine to justice since she kept walking murder after murder. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. During the six years the two shared and had a sexual relationship, Josephine was, of course, cheating on Clarence. She had found another young lover, Andre Savoy, who at this time believed that Clarence was a cousin, and that was all that he was, and he knew nothing about his new lady's crimes of the past. He was a fellow custodian, and he probably daydreamed and was so mesmerized by her beauty, but being in her presence and that's all he thought about. More than that, it was just work. Remember, rumor has it that she was very controlling to Andre, right down to going over his checkbook. They were now living together, and he had to ask if he could even leave the house. Josephine had to know everything that Andre was doing. Andre would do anything that she asked, and you guessed it didn't you? You're getting really good at this. By then, Clarence had already moved out. He was in another relationship with a person that wasn't a family member. It was a young woman who was expecting a child, and he was actually helping her. Around this time, Clarence had went missing, and a missing persons report was filed. His family was trying to find him. I mean, the family that wasn't sleeping with him. I have a feeling that Josephine knew exactly where he was. On June 26, 1996, in a drugged and seedy area of West Baltimore, 28-year-old Clarence Good was found dead, left in a trunk of his car on 2302 Avalon Street, underneath a blanket with a bag of cocaine pinned inside his underwear. He was shot in his chest and back. Circumstantial evidence led back to Josephine, along with a $100,000 insurance policy. She was the sole benefactor. The insurance policy was about to be canceled and couldn't be paid out. The insurance company had sent this mail to Josephine's address, where she then called to get information on that current policy. This would form some sort of basis of mail wire fraud. They actually couldn't get her on the murder. It had to be something. So it was the money. And her cousin lover's death. Josephine continued another relationship during or right after with Andre. On a rare occasion, I believe Wilma, she's some kind of relation to Andre Savoy. She would spend some time with Josephine, and Josephine just started bragging. She would tell her that she actually killed Clarence Good and held the article up to show that she had gotten away with it. If being around Josephine didn't make Wilma feel eerie, this definitely did. As terrified as Wilma was, she would go to the police and tell the police exactly what Josephine told her. Josephine was arrested on December 5th, 2001 on insurance fraud from over $165,000. Wilma would testify against Josephine along with Andre Savoy, who was going to be Josephine's next victim. Both equally scared would take the stand and anyone else who wasn't afraid to talk about Josephine. And not many would take the stand. In 2022, Josephine, 76 years old, was trying to get her case overturned. Many victims and witnesses had agreed to testify against her to keep her in jail only if it was certain that she wouldn't be released. 
Josephine Gray actually does have a release date. It's August 22nd, 2037. She will be 91 years old.